Welcome to End of Life University. Today I'm sharing with you an interview I did with my friend, Jeremy Damick, who tells us all about the replacement child, who is a child born after the death of a sibling, and the unspoken grief experienced by a replacement child. I think you'll find his story really fascinating. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you can get notifications whenever I post a new interview. And also go to eoluniversity.com slash support to find ways that you can help keep this channel and the End of Life University podcast on the air. Thanks, and here we go with my interview with Jeremy. Today, I'm so excited to welcome my, as my guest, my friend, Jeremy Damick, uh, who I think we've known each other for probably going on five years, four or five years now, Jeremy, and we've had wonderful conversations over this time. And so I'm really excited to be able to introduce Jeremy to my audience so that everyone can hear uh, his story because it's really fascinating and something good for all of us to know about. So we'll get into that in just a moment, but I'll tell you a little more about Jeremy. Jeremy has a master's in counseling psychology and has worked with families and their loved ones who are approaching the end of life. He has also trained as a chaplain at the Sojourn Chaplaincy Program at San Francisco General Hospital, where he cultivated a deeper foundation and understanding of grief, but also hope, which he brings into to his death and grief work with the dying and their families. And you can learn more about Jeremy and the work he does at his website, which is jeremydeathandgrief.com. And Jeremy currently lives in Mexico with his husband and their very special cat, Minnie. So Jeremy, welcome. I'm so glad we get to do this together. Yes, this is wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here with you, Karen. I really yeah, I, I'm just so interested in having you share your story because over time we've talked a lot about your own history with grief, the journey that you've been on, and it's been very fascinating. And the title of this talk is The Unspoken Grief of the Replacement Child. And just before we get started with anything else, I wanted to ask you to just tell everyone what we mean by that, by the replacement child. Um. Yes, I'll do that, but I just want to back up for one moment, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I just wanted to clarify with the uh, chaplain program, I did 120 hours of volunteer chaplaincy training. So I just wanted to... I guess, oh, okay. Um, okay. I, just wanted, I, I know I may have put that in the bio that way, but I just wanted to um, clarify that, that just before we get started. So there's no confusion outside of that. So I hope that's okay. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I just, yeah, wanted to start around what is a replacement child and um, also the other term that is used is subsequent child um, or subsequent sibling. So it's really about a child that is born after the death of a sibling or, um, or a child. Um, and so it was uh, coined, in, I believe, in 1964 by uh, psychologists Albert and um, Barbara King. And so, um, so it really speaks to um, the, the, the birth of a child after the, the death of, um, of, a, of a child. So uh, usually after, right after, or within the, the years after that. Um, so um, that is kind of the short answer to, to what a replacement child and a subsequent child is. And, and that's something, it's really interesting. I mean, I've known families, I mean, I've known people who were born after the death of a sibling, and I never had heard that term before, or actually even thought about, about this as mm -hmm. a situation or a setting for grief. And so hearing your story is what really fascinated me. And I feel like it's something all of us should know about and understand and may, maybe the best way for the audience to to hear about this is just for you to start telling us your story um, okay sure yeah um, um i would just like to say too i never knew that term until this past year or so so it was something that i didn't ever know about um and so uh my story begins i like to think of my story beginning in the womb um with my mom because i was conceived six months before my brother died and he died three months before I was born. 
Um, so that's really how I, I feel in my life, my journey began at conception in the way that um, I was absorbing everything from my mom. You know, my brother was born um, uh, with microcephaly, he was microcephalic. And also in talking to my brother, um, he found paperwork that he was also born with spinal bifida. Um, um, so it seems like there are multiple disabilities that um, he was born with. And so he wasn't expected to live. Um, and then I was born three months after um, he died. So I, I feel like um, I was kind of stewed in, in all the emotion and hormones that were happening within my mom that I was receiving. Um, and then after I was born and then as a kid, I always felt like there was someone missing at the dinner table, but I could never put my finger on it. And um, when I was playing with my neighbor, I think I was around the age of six or eight, we were shooting baskets down the street. Um, he mentioned my brother, Joel, and I had no idea who he was talking about. Um, Has no one so, in your family had ever talked about Joel or told you anything? Up to that point. Um, there was a photo, my mom had photos in, in the bedroom and there were five of us, you know, small little photos of us. And I just, the fifth one, I never really understood. And maybe she did mention it one time, but it was never, he was never part of a, part of a conversation that was ever a full conversation in our family. Um, and so that's when I went home and asked my mom and that's when she sat down and talked to me about him <clears throat> and let me know about him and her experience with him and what had happened. Um, so it was, um, you know, it was very difficult for her and my dad never talked about him. Um, so part of the story is also that we, we grew up in um, a dysfunctional family. And so um, my, my dad's parents and my paternal grandmother, my mom had told me that she said, well, he didn't get it from our side of the family. Um, mm. And that, um, and then my mom's side of the family, my, her parents, um, they tended to come and take care of him more. And um, she said, you know, your grandmother, my dad's mother never picked him up or touched him. Um, mm. So, so it I sounds it was, like there was a lot of like shame and guilt, perhaps, about, about Joel's birth altogether, and maybe not even an understanding of his condition and first of all that this happens sometimes and maybe they didn't had a difficulty accepting it yes i think there's a lot of guilt and shame and also this was 1972 um because my brother was placed into a state home in michigan um about six to eight months before he died um so he wasn't at home when he died um, i guess i my understanding is, and, and what I've been told is that his care became more um, difficult. And, and he, my mom wasn't able to care for him at home. Um, and then my brother told me that uh, my mom did sit them down, my three brothers, my three older brothers, um, and let them know that he was going to a special place. Um, uh, so he wasn't at home at, when he died. Um, and then he was never talked about. <sighs> Yeah, I, I was wondering about that after you found out that he had existed, at least the everything went back to quiet. No one no one spoke about him or or talked about him in any way or eulogized him or honored him. Um, yeah, I mean he was never talked about. Um and I was thinking back, you know, I don't he didn't have a he had a little grave marker and we never actually went to his grave to visit him. And he only had a, a gravestone much later. Um, I kind of remember when that happened. And that seemed like a, a big deal. Um, so he was buried next to my mom's parents, um, their plot in the cemetery. But um, he was never he was never talked about. And you and I have talked about the fact that you were, as you said, you were steeped in grief, really, in utero mm -hmm. from before you were born because of your mom's experience of grief and loss. And yet when you were a child, were you aware of feeling grief or sadness? Did that, or, or perhaps, I mean, you wouldn't have understood what it was at the time, but looking back, does it seem that you were experiencing that? 
I look back and I, I think about, I definitely, there was an unresolved grief. I mean, and I, there was definitely unspoken grief and there was also um, definitely disenfranchised grief, you know, because um, having a, um, a brother and a son that was born disabled, um, it wasn't talked about after he died. So it wasn't, there was no acknowledgement. Um, and I don't remember, um, I just feel like there's a huge space in my life that he was not talked about. Um, and if he ever did come up a little bit, my mom would start crying. And so it was just, it was clearly a very painful um, topic and subject uh, for my mom to talk about. And we knew it was just, my dad never talked about it. Um, and it was only later in my life um, through my own grief work that I began to, I always think of it as peeling layers of an onion off. Mm -hmm. um, because I had to deal with the, the most pressing grief, the death of my parents and, and some other close friends um, to get to the point where I could actually realize, oh, there's something here about my brother. Because um, as an adult, I began to, um, I began to um, want to know more about him and want to understand more about him and who he was um, in that way. But growing up, it was never, uh, never, was never talked about. Do you think in some ways each experience of grief you had when with your parents dying and with friends dying kind of brought you a little closer to as the layers of the onion got peeled away closer to seeing that there was this kind of deep seated core maybe of sadness and grief that you were carrying? I, yes, absolutely. And I also feel that I wonder, I've thought about this a lot. And I wonder too, after my parents died, if that door could be opened, right? Because they, they weren't allowed, they, they chose not to, for lots of reasons, not to open that door and to, to fully grieve. Um, and so I wonder after their death, if that, if that space opened up and allowed for that to come forward and to be acknowledged finally. Yeah, that totally makes sense that it was a secret that had to be held because it was too painful, especially for your mom, it sounds like. And so no one dared to violate that or, or bring it up all those years. And yet it's almost as if you were carrying this, you were carrying the grief for your entire family within you, maybe not realizing it or knowing it, but and that's you know that's what it feels like because I think of uh, transgenerational grief and trauma and ancestral grief and trauma and I I feel you know my hope in in my journey um, that I am offering healing for my family and for my ancestors and for my family and my parents and um, and my brother you know who who died um, in that way so that um, it can be healed in that way so that it can be fully acknowledged and then um, allowed to be present however that shows up. Did you feel that that you were drawn toward working around end of life issues? Um, I mean, did you understand why or do you feel like there was something within you pushing you in that direction that you that you weren't aware of? Um, it's funny because I, I always felt um, interested in working. I was always interested in cemeteries growing up. Um, and always kind of that always had a fascination for me. And I know in some of the studies that can be common in, in uh, replacement children or subsequent children um, that were drawn to the caring uh, field. And we tend to be caregivers. I was definitely a caregiver in my family. Um, I, I actually feel like we all kind of took on that role, <laughs> my brothers and I, to some degree, um, in, in our own way. Um, but this has turned into my profession. Um, in that way for me. And so um, I definitely feel drawn to this work. And I feel like I now understand why it makes sense if I can kind of put the pieces together when I look back at how my life began at conception and the experiences that I had not, maybe not fully aware of or not fully on a conscious level in that way. Yeah, that, that really makes sense. I mean, it's really interesting to think that the work you're doing now had its roots back before you were even born. And then you've been on this journey in a way of exploring that and also, I, I would guess, healing 
healing some of that because it has to have caused you pain in ways you didn't even understand or didn't really know where, where it was coming from. Absolutely. And I think also on this journey and in my work, it connects me to my brother. And I, I feel it takes me back to the connection to him and that also, again, honoring what was never able to be spoken. Because right? I'm the one talking about it now and I'm the one that is reaching out to find information about him. And That's so true. Understand. It's so true because in a way you were denied a relationship with him when you were younger with a memory of him you know he wasn't talked about you didn't see photos you didn't there was he wasn't included in your life in any way so you've had to bring him into your life now and give him a place at your table mm -hmm. and, and connect with him and that's really what it feels like because um it's interesting because i was talking to my oldest brother jeff um just a few days ago um, thinking about this podcast and I, I mentioned to him I said well not thinking I said he's a phantom brother to me like I don't like you know um, there's he's someone that is in the past that I had I I'm connected to but I'm I didn't know and it was interesting for me for him he said well he's not a phantom brother to me and it, it struck me in that moment that that is the I mean I think in some ways that's Kind of encapsulates a replacement child and a subsequent child right in that mm -hmm. way that he has experiences that i don't have um because he knew him as a physical living brother and um i never had that, in that way. yeah never had the actual experience with your brother but also even any stories to carry with you when you were young or or anything else any other mementos or recognition of him and i don't i mean i don't remember seeing very many photos of him either um but definitely when he died it, it seems like even from my brother's um account is that that was he wasn't talked about anymore it's as if he disappeared and you shared with me a photo of your brother, mm -hmm. a family photo. Would you like me to show that? Is this a good time oh, to? Oh yeah, yeah, it'd be great. This is. Um, Let's see. Obviously, before I was born. <laughs> yeah, before you were part of the story. So all four of your older brothers. Yes, uh -huh. and and my brother in the blue is Joel. And I believe that's his first or second birthday. I'm gonna guess that, that might be his second birthday. So before you were even conceived. Yeah, it seems like it. Yeah, because his birthday's in March. So um, it would have been before I was conceived. But, yeah. So, so I mean, it's so it's interesting because it's just a happy, normal family photo of a birthday celebration. And then to think that that you you weren't part of it and you weren't even told about these memories. I mean, when when did you find this picture? Um, I think I was going through photo albums as an adult um, and I found it and it may have been after my mom died. I can't remember now, um, but I found this photo and um, I actually took it from the photo album <laughs> um, because it was, it's the only physical um, tactile um, object or thing I have of my brother um, is that photo. I can imagine that. I can imagine a deep need for something tangible and physical that is a memento of someone you never got the chance to meet. Yeah. And and yet he played a really big role in your life. Like, like you're doing the work you're doing right now because of Joel. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I have to step back sometimes and just really take that in and, and really kind of hold space for for him and for my family and, and just for the grief and the experiences that led me to this point in my life um, in that way, especially when I look at the photo, I think of how much changed after he died. Yes, yes. And it feels it feels good even for me to know that we're we're honoring Joel's memory, just sharing this picture mm -hmm. and his birthday and uh, being able to honor him since he sort of got left out for so many years. Yeah, and I often think of 
you know, I often think of too, like just the, the unspoken pain and grief that both of my parents carry, because I don't even think they talked about in between them. I'm that, I'm not sure, but I just know that my mom said that, you know, your dad, it's something that he can't talk about. Um, it's too painful. For him. Wow. Like, just what a huge burden to carry over all of those years yeah. and, and not be able to deal with. Right. Do did Jeremy did you growing up did you feel expectation on you like to be perfect in certain ways or to be special or did it ever feel to you like there were um like you had to try to live up to something but you didn't know what it was you know I never felt that specifically um, my mom always told me she she always did and does her best to love us all equally um, so I really appreciate that from her. I think, you know, there, there are two um, categories that um, um, a replacement child or a subsequent child can fall into, and they're the inadequate child or the, um, the gift child. Mm. Um, and I think I've done a lot of, ref well, I don't know a lot, but I've done reflecting on this um, around that. And I grew up, um, <clears throat> I was, um, I started playing piano at six um, and that's where I went to. That was my entry into university too, was through music scholarships. Um, so I often think of in a way, I was very different from my Joel, uh, my brother, Joel. Um, and um, so in that way, I feel like it could have been, I could have been looked at as a gift child, right? Uh, because mm -hmm. I had this, this natural music, musical talent that started before I was six and I started taking lessons at six. Um, and I feel like the flip side of that is um, I came out as gay in se at 17. And so I feel like there's that's the inadequate part, right? Where um, I was looked at as, oh, something was wrong with me or I was sick um, in that way. Um, and I, and then I didn't, you know, I don't know if how much there was for me to measure up to Joel because of his disabilities that he wasn't um, he wasn't developed. He was really at three or three months old was where his development stopped. Um, so it's different in that way. But I know that um, my mother blamed herself for me being gay. She said that she thought she worried too much during her pregnancy for me, and that's what um, made me gay. And I. When I told her that I wasn't sick and that I was okay, somehow that switched for her. Um, we were always really close, but that really, she was able to finally let that go. Um, and maybe that was part of her healing journey and process too. Wow. Um, she, she carried so much guilt and self-blame for Joel and for you all those years that, that just feels really painful to imagine her carrying that and then how what a gift you actually were because you could be patient enough <clears throat> and you helped carry that burden I think for her mm -hmm. during that time and you could wait for, wait for her to find time and grace to have some healing yeah I think and even after my mom died then to also hold that space for my dad in that way for him to explore his own healing, whatever that was and how that was for him, but um, to hold a non-judgmental non space for him um, in the last years after my mom died and before he died um, to help him in, in that space. Um, when you mentioned the inadequate child and the gift child, I assume that comes from research that's been done on- It does come from research and those are two, um, um, terms that are used right? that the inadequate child is you, you can never measure up to the um to the the brother or sister that died um and that you're and it can show up in lots of ways it can show up that you know um they or they're always comparing the the, the um subsequent child to the the um the uh, brother or sister that died um and so you qu can never quite measure up and there's lots of ways how that shows up um, and also, um, the gift child is that you're treated extra special, um, and that you you really, like, 
we really are a gift. Um, hmm. You're a gift to us because you know your your brother or sister died, um, and so those are kind of how it can show up that way. And they both have their own um, challenges and maybe negative sides. Obviously, the inadequate one can be um, because you're always compared um, to the, the dead sibling, and then the gift child can always be. Um, can also cause um, feelings of of not like why am I such a special child, right? Um, in that way, that can uh, create feelings of guilt in that way too. And maybe even questioning, am I good enough to be the gift child, <laughs> or do they right. just think I'm gifted and they don't know the truth of who I really am? Exactly. I can, and it can. It feels like it. It feels like it's just something waiting waiting to go either way. I mean, um, cause there's either there, I feel like there's expectations in both, on both sides, different expectations, yeah. but, but they can create challenges and difficulties. I've heard some stories of families where the replacement child or subsequent child is actually given the same name as the child who died. Do you, is that very common or do you have any idea about that? I don't have a lot. I've, heard, I've read some stories about that and also the, or that the, the subsequent child is given them their uh, dead siblings middle, they, their middle name is now their dead siblings first name, right? So it's woven into somehow um, into who they are. And so I really feel like your identity is really fixed on the dead sibling at that point. And I don't know how much you can get away from that. But then some people really appreciate that. And because the family really honors the dead sibling. Um, yeah, it's true. It would keep the memory of the dead sibling alive in a different sort of way. But as you said, at least there's some sort of built in honoring of that child and, and recognition. Exactly. And I, I think that's a really important piece. And I think there's, we could say that's a healthier way that families actually um, embrace as difficult as the death of a child is. Um, you know, I've read where, where families actually honor the death date, right, or the birth date of the sibling and that they're part of the everyday conversation of the family in a healthy way where um, their, their memory is still held and, and cultivated in a way that, that they're part of the family. It makes sense to me that back in the early 1970s, when you were born, things were different. We weren't nearly as open about talking about death and difficult topics like this. But I wonder if it's if it really has changed. Are, are, are things any better now? Do you feel like families are more likely to be honest and open about a child who has died? Or I, I don't know if you've learned anything from the research you've done. Um. My sense is, my feeling is, and this isn't just in some of the research I've read, um, that it happens a lot more often than we know, and that um, I still is still an area that is not talked about openly. I think we've come um, moved in a better direction with that, but there's so much stigma that can be around a, um, a uh, sibling death or a child um, a child death still today. Um, I think definitely because we live in a death phobic culture. Um, and especially that the, the death of a child is so much, can be so much more profound in, in many ways um, for family that I think a lot of times what can happen is we just want to move on and go forward in that way. And it was a horrible event and we, we don't need to keep reliving it. Yeah, it's easier not to talk about it. But what have you learned? Like, what can the consequences be for the replacement child? Are there any studies there of what ha what effect it has on the replacement child growing up in that way with this big secret and and carrying this hidden guilt and grief? Well, it, it, I mean, in my own experience, and I think in, in what I've read is that it, it's there's a lot of questioning that we do about ourselves um, because there's um, there's this unknown part of of our life that is not that is not spoken about. So it can, I think, it can uh, create sen a sense of insecurity, or I'm not, you know, I'm not good enough, or I'm always questioning who we are. 
um, in that way because there's this part of our life that was never talked about um, or acknowledged. And it's, again, it goes back, I think, to that transgenerational trauma and grief that we carry with us because it's unspoken. Um, and we have, we have these feelings sometimes that we don't know where they come from in that way because, um, because it was this ambiguous loss, this, um, you know, this disenfranchised grief that no one talks about. And what happens is we carry it forward um, absorbing it psychically or however you want to say in that way that um, can show up in lots of problems as an adult. Um, you know, we, we know what unresolved grief, unspoken grief can do, you know, it can cause addiction, it can cause, you know, relationship problems, it can cause um, lots of things to, to uh, happen in our lives that are not positive. And I'm thinking it's interesting because you were experiencing your mother's grief when you were in utero, when you had no words, no understanding of anything, no way to, to be aware or conscious of anything that was happening, but you were experiencing the stress hormones and you were experiencing the energy of her grief and the sadness and carrying that with you. And I think that makes it somewhat hard to process because you yourself don't have a specific memory of, oh, that time when this happened, I'm sad about that. You can't tie these deep feelings of grief to anything specific. It has to feel very vague and kind of indescribable in a way. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the real challenge um, can be with, with being a subsequent child um, is that I, I didn't understand, I didn't have a place to set my grief down. There was no place, I couldn't talk about it to anyone. Um, I didn't know about it. I only learned about my brother, like I said earlier, when I was eight, around that. Um, and then it was only one time that he was spoken about. Um, so, you know, again, it, it, you know, and I think of also, I think of um, anticipatory grief. Like, I feel like I experienced that too with my mom because they were anticipating his death. Um, at some point, even before I was born in that way. So I feel like I just kind of got the whole, the whole basket of, <laughs> of grief experience in that way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, some, and I, I look at it now and I think, well, it may totally make sense that you're doing the work you're doing right now. Like you were primed to be aware of and to be able to hold and carry grief from from the moment you were conceived in a way. But I know that you've had to do some research, you know, even research into your brother and his life just to just to learn some of these details. And I was curious about what that process was like trying to learn about someone who's already died after your parents have died. I mean, what what was that like going through that process? Um, that's a really good question. Um, and I, you know, and still going through that now, trying to, at first, when I first went into this, this part of my grief experience with my brother and working with uh, Sarah Volman, who is um, an art therapist and a um, ther uh, licensed clinical social worker, um, she works, she herself is a replacement child, a subsequent child. Um, and there were lots of questions that came up for me around my parents like what was I conceived because they knew my brother was going to die and so they this was their last ditch effort <laughs> to have you know hopefully a, a healthy baby um you know so those questions came up like you know did they was I planned was I not planned um and that that was hard to sit with because then you know because then for then there's feelings of anger that come up about that so you know I was wanted but was I only there to fix a problem or hoping to fix a problem? I, I feel like on a deep level that wasn't the case, but still um, those are questions I, I have um, and have and had around that. And um, I really, I've taken time to sit with that. And, and where I find peace with that is that um, I'm here today. Um, and I know I was, you know, I, we were all a family and, um, I can't change what happened, um, but what I can do is at least acknowledge those questions for myself and come to a place where I think the hard part was not knowing that I'll ever really have an answer for a lot of questions around that. And so just being able to sit with that and allow that to be where it is. 
in that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. And um, I can say in, you know, you and I have talked about grief a number of times and you've listened to me talk about my grief and, you know, been a, su a support person. Oh, there's an echo for a second there. Um, well, let's see. Okay, sorry, this is the solves. Okay. Um, anyway, so what I know is that you have, you seem to have a really deeply intuitive nature around grief that doesn't, most of us are not born with that, but I feel like you have been born with this natural ability to just be present with grief and to sit with it in a way that, you know, many of the rest of us have spent years and years working on that, trying to develop our ability to be present and our ability to listen deeply and to get comfortable in a way with grief and to sit with it but when i'm with you it seems as if that comes naturally to you which makes sense to me but i don't know if you resonate with that at all when i say that to you um certainly yes so thank you for that that's so kind of you to say that and that does i think it definitely does resonate with me um because it's i'm i feel really called to this work in a way that um it, it just feels part of who I am. And I don't know how else to put that into words. I mean, it, it does make sense, I guess, when we look back um, in, in, in my journey and where I come from and my birth experience and, and utero experience. But um, I feel at home. I don't know how else to say it. In, in, in the space of grief and death, it feels very uh, natural for me. And it feels like a very... Um, I feel like I understand it on um, sometimes levels that I don't even, I'm not even aware of, but that, um, but it just, it's a very natural, as you said, intuitive part of who I am. And, um, and I love being present for, for grief and death and the work. Um, so it, it just, it's a very natural part of who I am. And it, it does make sense to me, the work you're doing now every day, helping people with grief really gives um, additional meaning and honor in a way to Joel and his life and what his life meant. And so like every day you're acknowledging Joel because you're doing this work that you were born to do. And uh, that that feels really nice, like a full circle in a way. And that every, through this work, you're he still healing your own grief and you're, mm -hmm. you're healing your mom and dad and Joel's life and uh, in your whole family, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it feels like to me. And that to me is, feels like such an honor um, in my work. And I feel like I really hold that space for them. Um, in the work I do, obviously separate from the work I do, but it, it's interwoven. And I think, you know, even when I work with clients, I talk about the integration of grief into our lives. I mean, it's, it's always going to be there. It's always going to be part of who we are. Um, but part of that is learning how to weave it into the tapestry of who we are now. Um, and that's part of that's how I feel the grief journey and my understanding of it, maybe for myself and in my work is that it's always about how we we fold that into who we are um, and how we can learn to express that in our life. Um, mm. So I feel like that is for me, what I'm working, I'm continuing to work to do for my parents, for my family and for my brother, Joel. Mm. That's so beautiful. And I'm really wondering like how many people out there listening are maybe waking up to think, oh my goodness, I think I was a replacement child. I mean, who, who might never have considered the significance of their birth order or, and, you know, never thought about the fact that they followed the death of a sibling somehow and um, who themselves might, might learn something about themselves and understand themselves better just hearing about your story and our conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hope that people, um, it's, I think it can be hard too, because if, especially if family is um, not willing to talk about it or parents have died or, um, or if you're an only child and not understanding that you were born after um, a, a sibling that had died and then there's no, sometimes it can take research and asking questions and it's also whether a family's willing to talk about it. It can be a really um, 
because there's a lot of um, shame around the death of a child, especially how they may have died um, and what, how that came to pass um, and how, and I think the family dynamics play into that so much too, about how open family is talking about grief and death um, in that way. Yeah, and then you mentioned that you found a therapist to work with who herself is a replacement or a subsequent mm -hmm. child. That seems really crucial also, because not very many people out there might understand what, what you're experiencing as a replacement child. Exactly, um, and I, I have to say, I, like my journey to, to work with Sarah Volman started with my initial therapist um, or counselor, grief counselor, um, um, Sari Luderman. Um, and so through my work with her is she knows Sarah as a colleague and that's how I got connected to Sarah um, in that way. So I just, I feel like um, it all kind of came together in a way that I could have never planned. Um, so I'm really so grateful for, um, for both of them and my grief work in that way. And now you, I assume you would be a great person for someone else dealing, um, dealing with the same type of grief to come and talk to because you just have a depth of understanding that the rest of us just, just don't have. We, we can't offer the same things, the same insights that you have. Yeah. And I still find that funny when, it, when I hear it, like, um, talk back to me like when you say that it's just that i'm like i still feel like oh like I, yeah i guess so like oh, oh yeah i'm a replacement or subsequent child you know um because in, in my work with uh with sarah um i had no idea there was a whole like there were other people that were out there like me right in that way so it was all this whole new world opened up in that way that i was blown away um I, I kind of liken it to it was almost like um, coming out again in that way. Like suddenly mm -hmm. there's all there's this whole community of people that um, that are like me. And also a body of research, it sounds like mm -hmm. you found a, around the replacement child. So it, it isn't just a few people talking about it. It's actually being studied. Exactly. And, and I think as time has gone on, because this I mean, this is the unique this is what's unique about replacement children and subsequent children is that there wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a big body of knowledge and research done even back in 2014, it was just starting to come to, um, to light. I mean, it was talked about before, but no one really researched it um, in a way that is, looks like is beginning to be researched now because uh, mostly it was with the siblings that experienced the death of, the, of their sibling not who was born after the sibling that, that mm. died. So there's this new area coming forward. Yeah, it's interesting because at least in the old days, what we used to, well, first of all, people used to say, oh, well, if the older siblings who experience the death of, of a sibling, they're too young, they won't remember it, it won't have any impact on them. And so of course, if they don't even acknowledge that the living siblings experiencing the death are going to be affected by grief, they'd never recognize that the unborn child who's coming next would also experience grief. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. I mean, and there's that whole part of, you know, um, we're going to move on beyond past that, right? Because we, we're not going to talk about that anymore because we have this new child um, that we're going to focus all our energy on in that way. Yeah. So it's, it's a new day. We've moved on. Right. And you know, no, this, this won't have an impact on any of us. And yet it has a lasting impact on everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's what I was talking to my oldest brother about um, just the other day is that 50 years on, his, his, he has a profound impact on all of our lives, um, whether we're aware of it or not. And I just, to me, I, that in some ways that takes my breath away, like that, how profound um, his almost three years of life um, have rippled through all of our lives and continue to um, impact our lives in ways that I think we're still figuring out and learning. Yeah, that it gives me goosebumps to hear you talk about that, you know, because uh, it, it, it's amazing the impact of 
one brief life, you know, in a child who was born with significant disabilities, and yet he had this huge purpose and so much depth of meaning to his life, and it's still reverberating. And, and even today, because imagine the people listening to this conversation who, who will be helped somehow or might be inspired to seek out a grief therapist for themselves because they, they never understood that they're still carrying grief from the past. Right. And I, yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right with that. And I, to me, I just, I always think of, of, um, of a drop of water falling into a pond and we just, I think we think of the ripple effect and how that, um, just continues to go out and out and out um, in that way. And we just don't know what that effect is going to have on any of us um, until we get to that place where we can maybe acknowledge it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's really beautiful um, to think mm -hmm. about that. And that through all the pain and the, the guilt and the grief and the sadness and the pain that your mom and your dad carried, that there can be this like beautiful healing and kind of resolution or beginning of a resolution that can happen so much later in life, but also the gift in all of it be is mm -hmm. manifesting in a way now through the work you're doing. Exactly. And I think it feels like, again, for me, is it's that space of honoring and then I can be, with, it allows me to be with my own grief and tap into the unspoken grief. And I, I feel like the grief that my parents um, weren't able to speak. And I always hope that I'm giving voice to their grief too. And even, you know, even the grief of my brothers that, um, that uh, they weren't able to speak at that time um, and whatever that means for them yeah. um, in that way. Um, so I, yeah, I feel like it's, it's a, I feel like, I feel like it's healing on, on lots, so many levels. Um, and I just, I feel blessed and honored to be able to, to be doing this today in my work and, and really holding that space for, for all of that. Well, I know you mentioned that you had some resources that you wanted to share if anyone's interested in learning more. And first of all, I'll put links to the, you're going to send me the links. I'll put them on the, the show notes for this episode at EOLUpodcast.com. But if you wanted to describe what it is that you have to share. So. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so um, the first um I would like to share is um, Sari Luerman. Uh, she's a grief counselor. She's who I worked with starting in 2019. Um, and she she was really instrumental in, in my grief work. And so uh, grief counselor um, in Massachusetts, and I'll, I'll share the link, I'll send that to you. Okay. Um, and then Sarah Volman is the, um, I worked with her um, around replacement child work, subsequent child work. Um, and I'll send information to you about her link in the article she's written, and we can find more about her also. And then there's also Inviting Abundance with uh, Joanne and Will, um, and they're in North Carolina. And I did work with them around um, a, a grief immersion for death workers. Um, and so that was really important. And they also do work around um, infant child loss. Um, and so I'll send, um, their link also and then um finally <laughs> there's one more um so uh, and this is there's two more actually sorry so the other one is um ekr uh, mexico.org here and that i did a five-day retreat a death doula retreat there and so what really came up and why is that that is really important is because that's where the trans generational um ancestral grief and healing really came uh, forward for me in that way um, and that was back in March. And then finally, um, there's Ambiguous Loss UK, um, and they do work around ambiguous loss. And I'll send you that link, and, and her name is Chloe. Um, mm. So just those are really important aspects of my work that have brought me to where I am here today. Yeah. Thank you for that, because I'm sure people will be wanting to learn more. But also, if anyone feels inspired and would like to talk to you or work with you, mm -hmm. can they reach you through your website? Absolutely, yes. Um, I have information and Instagram too. Um, they can reach me on Instagram at Jeremy Dominic Death and Grief Support. Um, and my website also, um, Jeremy Death and Grief.com, and, and they can reach me there. Um, I'd be more than happy to talk with anyone if they're 
um, open to that. Yeah, that's really wonderful because I'm imagining there there will be people who feel inspired by our conversation or who have memories come back or think of things that they, the secrets in their own family, we, we all have that, so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and it's funny that you mentioned that because they've just been talking with my brother, Jeff, all of a sudden he was having memories come back um, about my brother, Joel, that he, you know, that had been kind of um, back and dust been that started to come forward as we started to talk more about that. So I think, I think that's part of the work too. Um, and, and honoring that our grief is allowing those memories to come forward. Definitely. I just, one thing I did that just occurred to me, did you do any sort of ritual at all around your brother's death? Cause I know that you, um, you know, you, I know, I know that you're open to the idea of rituals. I was just curious if you have any sort of rituals that you've done. Um, so at the, uh, uh death do the retreat in, um, San Miguel de Allende here in Mexico, I took, we had a big altar, um, um, so I had a photo. I do have a photo of him, actually, the photo that you shared that's above my altar here. Um, but I had an altar there. So it was a ritual we did around family and ancestral healing and ancestral grief. So he was part of that. And my own work here at home is he's always part of my altar. And I always, um, and um, I continually, my, my ritual is honoring him and remembering him. Um, and allowing him to be present in my life rather than um, forgetting who he is mm. that way. That's very, very beautiful. I'm going to share the picture again while we're, <laughs> um, sure. while, while we're closing here because uh, I really appreciate that you shared Joel with all of us. You know, we got to hear your story. We got to get to know Joel and to see the impact on your life and Joel being the reason that you're here today. And that's, that's very special. Well, thank you for allowing me the space and hold, holding the space for me to be able to um, talk about my brother and share my brother and my family with, and our experience and my experience with everyone. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Karen. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, thanks. I'm sure probably there will be more revelations and you'll have more to share down the road. Oh, yeah. And I, yeah. I look forward to our ongoing conversations that we have with each other and staying with you as just some small part on your journey. So thank you. Yeah, certainly. And I'll be sharing more on my Instagram. And I think as I um, begin to put together my website a little more, I'm going to have some more information on there about my experience with uh, being a replacement and subsequent child also. And I hope you'll do right. I hope you'll do some writing about it. Or that will be wonderful. <laughs> uh, yeah. And when I do, I'll, I'll certainly share it with you. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Jeremy, for taking time out and talking with me today. Absolutely. And, and thank you for allowing me to be here. I really appreciate it. Thank you so you're, much. You're very welcome, my friend. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed my conversation with my friend Jeremy Damick about the grief of a replacement child and grief that can occur and affect us even in utero before we're born. I think it's really important for us to be aware of this type of ancestral grief and to understand our own family history and the kind of pain and loss that has occurred for for our forebearers, what have they experienced in their lives? What did they go through that may have been handed down to us and may have influenced us from before the time we were born? As we talked about, the path Jeremy is following now has very much been shaped by this experience of being a wash, really, in his mother's grief since the time he was conceived. I was so touched when he talked about the pain and the shame and the anxiety and worry and fear that his mother endured for all of those years and carried with her and what a tremendous impact that had on her life and then how powerful the healing was that she and Jeremy were able to achieve together later on in his life. I really do believe that this 
ancestral grief is something we all carry within us. And it's only when we have the courage to look within ourselves, to identify it, and to re- truly sit with the pain and be able to share it with others and talk about it. That's when this kind of powerful healing can happen. And it really is the way to create peace for the people that we love, to be able to step up with courage and dive into those very painful feelings and memories and things that have been have been carried by families for generations. So I so admire Jeremy for doing this work in his own life and then for joining me today and sharing this with all of you. And I hope that you have found it beneficial as I have. And I want to mention Jeremy left a lot of resources for us. He sent me a whole list of resources and I've put them into a PDF file And you can download it from the show notes for this episode at eolupodcast.com. Go to episode 357. There will be a link to download the PDF file. So it has a lot of resources. It has links on the page. If those links don't work from the PDF file, you can just copy them and paste them into your browser in order to get to those resources that Jeremy shared. And um, I think those will be very helpful if you're interested in learning more about the grief of a replacement child. So um, I want to thank you once again for tuning in and joining me every week on this podcast. If you enjoy the the content that I share, I hope that you will tell other people about it. If you know someone who might benefit from it as well, uh, show them how to how to subscribe on their podcast app and listen in. And if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do wherever you happen to listen and leave a review and a, a rating for the podcast because that really helps us move up in the rankings so that people can find these episodes when they're searching for this kind of information. So once again, thank you to all of you who have been supporting me from afar for all these years, sometimes financially by making contributions, but also sending me emails and text messages and letting me know when you appreciate an episode. That means so much to me. Until we're together again next week, remember that we're here for love. So if nothing else, that's what we all need to focus on right now. Just how can we bring more love to the world? So face your fear. Be ready for whatever life brings you next because you just never know what it might be. And love each and every moment of your very precious life. Bye-bye.